the Honorable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank the member for his speech in this matter. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the member could speak to there are a number of ways that a country such as Canada can assist the lesser developed nations in building uh, good governance, democratic processes, rule of law, and frankly, sustainability systems for their economy. And I wonder if you could speak to perhaps it makes more sense in the case of a country such as Honduras, which has such a pure, poor human rights record, poor record on, on rule of law, and obviously dire poverty, that is this not a nation where in fact we should be looking towards providing foreign aid in the form of good governance, rather than seeking to trade where it is not clear that the mass of the people of Honduras will derive any benefit whatsoever from our trade. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Well, I thank my colleague for her, her excellent question. Um, yes, Canada, Canadians have a lot to uh, teach foreign other countries. We used to be able to talk about fair democracy. I'm not so sure in light of what's going on in our country we have much to brag about these days. But generally speaking, we have been t uh, experts in sending people to other countries to talk about good governance arrangements. We have a lot of NGOs who are involved in that field. And uh, before it was uh, transformed, to use a neutral word, by our Conservative government, we were very proud of CETA and its work in trying to assist countries in, in development, such as Honduras. But, Mr. Speaker, Professor Mark Rule of, uh, has, has written the following about Honduras. Opinion surveys over the last decade have shown ordinary Hondurans are much less committed to democratic institutions than most other Latin Americans and are more willing to see their political leaders employ undemocratic means." Close quote. So the country itself, understandably with over almost half of its population in extreme poverty, may not be putting their attention on democratic institutions of this, at this time, which is why the corruption is so high, why it is in the most violent area in the world, according to The Economist magazine, and maybe why, as my colleagues suggest, Canada could make some contributions to improve that, uh, that, that economy and that civil society. Uh, but I fear that this agreement, this trade agreement before Parliament, is not that answer. Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it is my privilege to rise in this place and speak to Bill C-20, uh, which sets forth a, a trade agreement between Canada and the country of Honduras. As my colleague from Victoria has stated, the regrettable fact is that this transparency and participation by the members of this place has occurred so late in the day, which has been the case with every trade agreement that this government has brought forward to this place. Unlike the process that has followed in most Western democracies, where the duly elected members of Parliament are provided information day one in the negotiation process, and, Mr. Speaker, the kind of matters that uh, parliamentarians should be informed on before the bill comes to the House where essentially the deal is already cast in stone would include critical factors, uh, which this government professes that it gives con due consideration to, including the human rights record of the country that Canada is seeking to provide preferential treatment and trade with, uh, value added to Canadian trade, is it worthwhile to send our officials off to be spending their time negotiating this trade deal as opposed to putting their efforts toward nations where these factors already exist, um, whether or not it's a stable democratic regime including uh, democratic processes and rule of law. Um, clearly an important factor. Um, surely, Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons why we enter into these trade agreements providing preferential uh, trade provisions is we are showcasing to uh, potential investors from Canada that this is a place where you can do business and we're giving preferential rights. And therefore, uh, Canadian investors, whether large or small, would be given some level of assurance that their investment is going to be safe and protected under some kind of a rule of law regime. Uh, we have seen recently with the demise of some regimes around the world uh, where our party, frankly, into some dissenting reports have raise concerns and the government has not been willing to do that. So uh, one would raise the question whether this bill goes through or not. Um, is the government providing any uh, riders to this informing Canadian investors that some of their investments may, may well be at risk because of the state 
of the government regime in Honduras. Um, I will reiterate only briefly, uh, Mr. Speaker, concerns that have been raised by others in the House about uh, the state of the regime in Honduras. Uh, the current government regime uh, came into place in 2010 through what is said to be a very undemocratic and illegitimate uh, election. Uh, we hear litany after litany of continuing human rights abuses, killings, arbitrary detentions, severe restrictions on public demonstrations, protests and freedom of expression, and interference with the independence, independence of the judiciary. We are told, Mr. Speaker, that Honduras has the highest murder rate in the world and is considered a very dangerous country for, for journalists. Um, a normal person, a normal investor would say, is it going to be safe for me to invest my dollars there? Is it going to be safe for me to send my workers there if they decide to set up some kind of a special operation? Um, clearly, as been shared in the House, Mr. Speaker, Transparency International ranks Honduras as the most corrupt country in Central America, is a major drug smuggling center, and has the worst income equality in the region. Clearly, a nation uh, that could use assistance and one would raise the question, instead of rushing into a trade deal to give preferential treatment, obviously to a small uh, portion of the populace that has control of the dollar, should we instead be working with other donors around the world and trying to help Honduras build a more democratic regime? But Mr. Speaker, for the remainder of my time, I wish to speak to an abject failure of our government in living up to its commitments that it would pursue an economic strategy for sustainable development. And trade deal after trade deal that this government has brought forward to this place has been undermining previous undertakings by the Government of Canada that they would make protection of the environment or sustainable development a key component of the trade deals. Why am I deeply concerned about this, Mr. Speaker? I had the privilege of being the first head of law and enforcement for the NAFTA Environment Commission, based in, in uh, Montreal. It was a, a breakthrough agreement uh, under the NAFTA trade agreement with Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And while some had argued that it should have been encompassed in the actual trade deal and was promised that the next trade deal is coming, that would happen, at least it came forward and it was a deal signed by all three governments. Well, what we've seen, Mr. Speaker, is this government has essentially shredded the basics of that initial, actually very well-founded and credible agreement. Unlike under the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation, where the three signatories to the NAFTA agreement, Mexico, Canada, United States, signed on to create a Council of Environment Ministers to oversee all of the issues to do with environment and trade. Well, we see no such council. Every trade deal that this government has initiated, including this one in Bill C-20, does not have duly elected officials heading up this matter to provide the oversight. It simply would be a committee of government officials, unspecified. So we don't even know who in Canada or in Honduras will be overseeing and ensuring that uh, the rights of the people in Honduras will be protected should there be Canadian investment. There is no independent secretariat, a very important part of the NAFTA agreement. Uh, a full-time employed secretariat with experts from uh, representatives from both nations delivering the work, ongoing, actually uh, digging in and making sure that economic development actually protects environment towards the future. Absolutely zero accountability and engagement of the public and impacted communities in this trade agreement under Bill C-20. Unlike the uh, NAFTA environmental side agreement, where there was a creation of a joint public advisory committee with representatives of industry, representatives of the public, representative farmers, who would advise regularly the Council of Ministers. No such body. Under the NAFTA agreement, we had a National Advisory uh, Council appointed in each of the countries. No National Advisory Council. So absolutely no scrutiny, no involvement of the Canadian public in how this uh, deal proceeds and is implemented, and also none of the same in Honduras. Uh, under the NAFTA environmental agreement, there was a provision for any citizen within North America could file a complaint of failure to effectively enforce environmental law. And when the NAFTA deal was signed, there was a great hue and cry, well, you're going to have all this economic development. 
but what about, are they going to be undermining environmental protections that were there already? So there was a provision allowing any uh, resident of the three countries to file a complaint which would be duly investigated and reported out publicly. No such provision. Uh, under the Bill C-20, a resident of Honduras or Canada could file a complaint to some undesignated official in that country. Well, given the lack of credibility of the government regime in this country in taking environmental damage seriously, and given what has been stated about the state of governance in Honduras, how can we have faith that any citizen might be brave enough to come forward and file such a complaint and that will be dealt with in any kind of a credible manner? Unlike the NAFTA agreement, where there is a clearly specified framework for effective environmental enforcement. And Mr. Speaker, I can speak to that fact because I have been a member of this incredible international body on cooperation on effective environmental compliance and enforcement. 180 countries around the world working together and talking about the specific components of effective enforcement of environmental law to give credibility to that kind of a structure. That framework was set out in the environmental side agreement to NAFTA. It is completely absent in Bill C-20. Again, in, uh, my final comment would be a very important part of uh, the NAFTA environmental agreement was transparency and participation. And so throughout the North American Agreement Environmental Cooperation, you have the right to file a complaint of failed enforcement, the right of private access to remedies where you feel the environment is not being protected, procedural guarantees to be able to resort to the courts if your community is damaged. None of these provisions exist in this side agreement. So what we see, Mr. Speaker, is a great downgrading of once was a model for sustainable economic development around the world that Canada had initiated. And this government has completely shredded that regime and paid no heed whatsoever. Their talk about participation, transparency, and environmental protection is clearly uh, reflected in this agreement. It is completely absent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questione commentaire, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the comments uh, from the member. wanted to just ask uh, questions in regards to uh, trade agreements, uh, and in principle, is something in which uh, we in the Liberal Party have uh, always been fairly supportive of, recognizing uh, the importance of trade uh, to uh, Canada's uh, economic and social fabric. Um, my question to the member is just uh, related to uh, trade agreements in general, uh, to what degree does, uh, does she feel uh, that uh, her political party uh, or what sort of considerations primarily uh, would be taken into account when they review uh, a trade agreements uh, be in determining whether or not to support or not support? Uh, yeah. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, all of the members and the official opposition have been very clear in what their priorities are. Uh, first and foremost, a record uh, of human rights and transparency and good governance. And uh, a good number of my colleagues have spoken to that. I spoke briefly to that. I would think that that would be a starting point. Uh, secondly, that there would actually be some kind of a genuine benefit to Canadians from entering into such an agreement. That includes maintaining our reputation for honouring as a precondition that we only deal with people in good faith and that there is rule of law, that there is observance of human rights and protections for Canadian investors. But thirdly, that we not start undermining and downgrading the very provisions that many fought for and worked very diligently for to put in place in trade agreements uh, previously, but we have not seen since under this government. Question and comments. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Brome, Mississauga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her speech, which was very persuasive. I would like to her comment on something that was said by The Economist, which is not particularly a left-wing left publication in my view, but The Economist indicated that the Honduras, uh, that Honduras is one of the most violent areas of the world. Is it a good idea to establish trade or encourage trade with a place like that? 
I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I spoke to, I would think that one of the preconditionings for entering into a preferential uh, trade agreement is to provide some level of assurance. Once we sign off on that deal, we're sending signals to Canadian investors. This is a safe place, a good place to invest your dollar. And uh, we have yet to have the government come forward and show us how the government of Honduras is addressing the erosion of rule of law, the erosion of the democratic processes. And frankly, I think that uh, uh, credible Canadian investors are also going to want to look to the issue of human rights abuses. And so, uh, no, I do not see that the government has brought forward a, uh, a credible case for uh, the signing off and the voting in favor of Bill C-20. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Bournois Salaberry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his remarks and also what, ask him what he thinks about uh, an issue that is that uh, Honduras is a, a place where uh, the political regime is oppressive. This doesn't seem like the kind of country that Canada really wants to promote trade with. We know that human rights are not respected. There are policies that are not in line with the standards that we would promote, and I would like his comments on that. Member for Edmonton Strathcona, you have about 50 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, in response to my colleague's question, I would simply share um, what the Canadian Council for International Cooperation, America's Policy Group, has said. In quotes, we have long maintained that under the right conditions, trade can generate growth and support the realization of human rights. These conditions simply do not exist in Honduras until there is a verifiable improvement in the country's democratic governance and human rights situation. The Canada-Honduras Free Trade Agreement will do more harm than good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.